Okay. Hello, hello. So, end of the first day, right? And I hope you're enjoying, right? Yeah. Ah, okay, no need to repeat this. <laughs> Uh, okay, Jeremy, nice to have you here. Welcome to Belgrade. Welcome to HIPCOM. Um, I guess you're the right person to ask what's the time, right? Uh, to ask which of the... Uh, what's the time? What's the time? Yeah, it mm. is... Uh, well, it's modular sense Yeah, time. but you have just one clock now and, and at home you have oh, more clocks. I have a lot of clocks, <laughs> that's true. I collect clocks. Okay. So. I have about 60 or 70 in my home at the moment. Oh, and, okay. Um, so yeah. you're the right person. To <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. But they're they're not all correct. Actually. Well, yeah. At least <laughs> one points the right time, right? Yeah. Twice a day. <laughs> Twice a day. Yeah. That's right. Um, and can you tell me about that adventure game that you're making with your uh, yes. kids, right? Yeah. So my daughter is 12, and she uh, is an artist, and she's into retro video games. Okay. And we've awesome. started building a game together, and she is doing the sprites and animation mm -hmm. and walk cycles, and I'm doing some of the programming in uh, Game Designer Studio. Awesome. And yeah. Maybe next year we can see that in action, right? Maybe. I mean, we're free, f uh, you know, just submit, and we are going to show it. Cool. It's present it here. Okay. Love to. Okay. So. Enjoy play. <laughs> okay. Play your presentation. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. So thanks for joining. Um, this is going to be a, a non-traditional talk. Um, it's about modular synthesizers, and I have one right here, and microservices. And I'm going to convince you how they're they're kind of related, actually. Um, my name is Jeremy Seitz. I'm a hacker musician. I'm the CTO at Ricardo.ch, which is uh, the largest online marketplace in Switzerland. Uh, this is a picture of me about 25 years ago. I've had a passion for synthesizers and making, making electronic bleeps and bloops, as they say. Um, so yeah, what is Ricardo? Ricardo is actually an interesting place. It's kind of like eBay, but it's specific to Switzerland. It's been around for 18 years. What makes it really cool is you have a lot of passionate, interesting people that have interests. Swiss people tend to buy nice stuff, and they hold on to it and take care of it. We sell everything from model trains to farm equipment and everything in between. Uh, just as an example, this is what's for sale right now. I took some screenshots last night. You can buy uh, this very nice e-bike for 425 francs by auction. It will end in a few days. Um, could be a really good deal. You might also be interested in this stamp, which um, it's only 12,500 francs, and that is a very high density if you think about the amount of paper versus the, uh, the cost. Um, it's also something that you would not want to get lost in the mail if you bought it. There's also something I personally love. I'm a big fan of trains. Um, this is a 1930s model train. Um, these are actually really hard to find, and there's tons of people doing this in Switzerland on Ricardo. And if you happen to have so much disposable income, you might want to store it in a vintage cash register. This is actually a, another thing. This is a Swiss, Swiss model from probably the early 1900s. If money is not an object, you might actually consider a Bosendorfer piano, which is also for sale on Ricardo right now. Uh, I should mention that our business model allows us to take a cut of every transaction, which is really nice. And uh, if you're very, very extravagant, uh, a Ferrari 330 could also be purchased today. So, um, but really the stuff on Ricardo that I find most interesting is the quir quirky and strange things. And I believe that if you're going to start collecting things, the future is in garden gnomes. Because garden gnomes are just so incredibly cool, and there's a lot of them in Switzerland. And you might have someone steal it from your house and then take it on a tour around the world and take pictures and send them back to you, which is awesome. So what does this have to do with uh, microservices? Well, um, how did we build all of this stuff that you just saw? It was built with these technologies. We use um, pretty much a cutting edge stack. We've managed to make a lot of different technologies work together and uh, create a modern platform. And we did it in only two years. We were originally, two years ago, based in .NET and C Sharp and a lot of legacy that was very, very old. and now. More than 70% of our platform is migrated to this new technology. But it isn't actually the technology that makes it so cool, because what really makes it cool is the team behind it. This is my team, the product managers, the designers, the engineers at Ricardo. They're a really cool group of people. They're creative, they're funny, they're interesting, they're extremely smart, and we actually span 
Uh, Switzerland, we have an office right here in Belgrade, we have an office in France, and we all work together, we travel, um, we cook together, and so forth. But before I go too much into that, this is a patch cable. This is something that I, I particularly love, and it is the, the most important thing that you need in working with a modular synthesizer. And in order to get a patch cable to work, you also need an oscillator. What is an oscillator? It is anything that goes back and forth. So you can think of a pendulum as an oscillator. You could also think of a guitar string as an oscillator. And an oscillator makes waves, and waves make sound. And let's hear what those actually sound like. So let's see if the video comes up. If I were to, oh, one second. Camera went to sleep, bear with me. There we go, should get a signal in. There we go, awesome. Okay. <laughs> yes. it's, this is kind of like live coding, so you, you have to be aware that things may actually catch on fire, we'll see. Um, okay, so I'm going to take a patch cable and plug it into an oscillator. This is a Dixie 2 oscillator. I'm going to give it a sawtooth wave. Maybe you can see that there. No, you can't, but... And then I'm going to plug that in and turn it up. Okay, I could do that all day. Um, but what's actually cool about this is um, I have just basically sent audio from one module to an output module. But you'll notice when I was turning that knob, I was changing the frequency. Um, if I take a different, a different cable, I can plug it into another. There's a jack on here that is called one volt per octave. And one volt per octave allows me to actually control that knob with a different knob. And that is called a control voltage. If I touch it, it actually changes. So now I'm using a completely different knob to do the same thing, but I can change the range of it. Okay, anyway. So, what you heard were a variety of different waves. Um, the oscillators actually produce sine waves, they produce triangle waves, they produce square waves. Uh, does anybody here work with this kind of stuff? Do you know about waves? Okay, there's one person there. Another person, oh man, I've got some friends here, this is awesome. So I particularly like uh, triangle waves, that's, that's my favorite. But uh, maybe I should tell you a little bit about this synthesizer. This is not the only synthesizer I own. Um, but a synthesizer is made up of modules. And each one of these things that were on the synthesizer are independent, completely isolated units. Um, they are made up of a, a couple of circuit boards, one for the control uh, components and one for the sound generation or modulation type things. This particular one is from a kit that I built myself. I purchased it online and, and put it together. Uh, the kits are actually really fun to build. You get all the different parts and it's through hole soldering. Uh, if you've ever worked with electronics and soldering, it's actually not hard to do. Uh, you can learn it pretty quickly and like anything, you can learn all things on YouTube. So a couple of YouTube videos and you're good to go. I actually don't build all of my modules. I buy a lot of them secondhand. And by the way, I work at Ricardo, which is awesome. And Swiss people are also into synthesizers as people all over the world. And there's a lot of modules going for sale all the time on Ricardo. This is also really cool because if I buy a module I don't like, I can sell it on Ricardo and recoup a lot of the money so I can buy other things. Uh, by the way, if you're building microservices and you build a module that you don't like, you're probably not gonna be able to sell it. So when I first started, I became fascinated. I, you know, years ago I worked with synthesizers and then everybody told me the future is computers, use plugins, use virtual analog, all of that kind of stuff. And I found it very unsatisfying. And one night I was watching a video on YouTube and I saw a guy talking about this module here called the Atlantis. 
and it was so beautiful. It literally made me cry. So I said, I got to have this module. And sure enough, I found one eventually on Ricardo for sale, and I purchased it. I got it, and I realized I couldn't do anything with it because I didn't have a case. So I was like, OK, I, I need to put it in a case. Uh, then I got a case, put it in there, and then I realized I still couldn't do anything with it because I had no way to get the output. So I needed an output module, which is this thing on the far right. And then I thought, maybe I should actually learn about this stuff and do my research before I start buying parts. Uh, pretty soon, with the components you see here, I was able to generate patterns and start making some music and things like that, and I became addicted. Uh, about a month later, my system started to look like this, and I had a pretty complete system. I could make music and sound effects and ambience and all kinds of things, but then I got a little bit crazier, and I soon filled that case up. But then... Despite what my wife was telling me, I actually continued to buy. There is something in the industry called gas. It's gear addiction syndrome. And uh, when you have it, you can't stop. And I wanted to discover more and more modules. There's thousands of them out there. Uh, and eventually, I ran out of space. And I said, look, I, I can't even buy a case that's big enough to hold my stuff. So I, I happen to know a bit about computer-aided design and woodworking. I'm an amateur, but I said, I'm going to design my own case. And I want it to look like a spaceship. So I researched it and figured out what would be the coolest design so I could have equidistance between my arms and the case and be able to look. And it would be ergonomic and so forth. And so I did that. And then I needed to learn how to actually cut the wood. So I bought a router, and I tried to figure out how to cut circles and wasted a lot of wood. And then once I figured that out, I realized I needed metal rails. And these are standard rails, which I ordered from England. And they finally arrived after many weeks, and I put the rails in, and then I had to figure out how to get them all aligned perfectly so they would be straight and the modules would actually not pop out or something. Uh, and then I really became obsessed with the fact that I didn't want to have visible screws on the outside of my case. So I thought, OK, 3D printing. Maybe I can make 3D printed parts that hold the wood in place. And then that way, I won't have visible screws. And if the wood is cut one or two millimeters off, I can still move it around within these things. And this turns out to be a really cool solution. And finally, I got the whole thing assembled. But then I needed power. So I found this company in California called Tragatronics that makes these power distribution boards for modular synthesizers. And I ordered those. By the way, this company's slogan is uh, that their machines kill fascists. Uh, they're very liberal on the West Coast, which is, which is fun. Um, so I got that installed and figured that out. And pretty soon, I ended up with my case. This is what it looked like as of a couple of weeks ago. Um, my daughter has painted some of the blank panels in there, which will eventually be replaced with more modules. So at the moment, I have a maximum of 10 amps of capacity at 12 plus and minus 12 volts. It also supports 5 volts on the rails. I can hold up to 150 modules with the connectors that I have. Today, I'm only using 5 amps and 71 modules, so I've got a ways to go um, until it's completely full. And my wife said, you are not going any bigger than that. And I made an agreement to sell my car to fund my um, hobby. So I now take the bus, and I ride the bicycle, and I'm getting more fit as a result. <laughs> so actually planning these things is difficult. Um, there turns out to be a tool online called Modular Grid, which is a web application which contains a huge directory of thousands of modules. You can go there and find all these modules, and you can drag and drop and arrange them into the, into the screen and plan your thing, because it turns out when you screw everything in, it takes forever. So it's really nice to have a planning tool. And they include lots of information about each module, and there's a marketplace. So there are links to things, and I'm trying to get Ricardo on that list as well. So, like any good engineer, you don't start a project unless you have a product vision. And I think that product vision is very important. And so I decided that my product vision was this. Yeah, I know. And by the way, a word of advice to you. Some of you might be interested in getting into music and things like that. Um, there are many other instruments that you should consider to choose because they result in social relationships or love relationships. And uh, if you do choose to get into synthesizers, I will guarantee you the rest of your life will be about more synthesizers. But what does this have to do with microservices? Well, talking about Ricardo, we have about 80 microservices in production. They're written in a variety of languages, but mostly Go, Java, and Node are what we're using. And we have event 
buses which connect things, they're triggered events which are using Kafka. That was our weapon of choice. We have a really cool environment where we say if you write code on your laptop and you get a code review and everything's cool and you merge your pull request to master, it automatically goes into production with CI and CD. So uh, along with that, you need to have very good monitoring, tracing, and logging to make sure that you don't screw things up. And the ownership in microservices is tricky. Who is responsible for this? When you break things down into tiny pieces, who are the people to talk to? So we have topic teams, which cover the product areas, and they cover the, our domain. We're domain-driven, and uh, that's how that works. But you know what? Forget that. Let's talk about filters. So I'm going to continue with that previous module that I had. And I'm going to plug it into a filter here. And a filter basically manipulates the sound of the signal. Let's see if you can hear that. Don't hear anything yet. In, oh, I need output. It's my fault, don't worry. For many of you, this may be a very familiar sound that um, on a lot of albums, it, when you think of a synthesizer, you think of this. That's what a filter does. This is, in particular, a low-pass filter. And it is one of the nicest sounding things in the world. I can't stop. OK. so. So what's happening here? Um, the way a filter works is it's kind of like you know EQ, treble and bass, that you might have on your stereo. But it emphasizes a particular frequency in the frequency band. And years ago, when people were working with filters, um, they were used to shape sound. So you can, in this case, a low-pass filter is actually allowing the low, low frequencies to go through and cutting off the high frequencies. But you've probably heard of the Moog synthesizer from Robert Moog, when he was designing the transistor ladder filter, he made a mistake. And that mistake caused a feedback to happen at the resonant frequency, which is called the resonance. And this happy accident created the signature sound of what we think of when we hear synthesizers. But there's another thing going on, which is this beautiful graph here is actually uh, the harmonic sequence. If you've ever played guitar or played with a string that's vibrating, you know you can touch it in certain places and it sounds really beautiful all of a the sudden. These are the resonant frequencies that the, in the harmonic sequence. You've, you've actually divided it mathematically perfectly into, into half or thirds or fourths or fifths and so forth. Uh, resonant filters take advantage of this and bring the sweetness of sounds out. And the filter I just played for you is actually a Jove filter. It's a, a faithful reproduction of a filter that appeared in Roland Jupiter 6 from 1983, which by a lot of people is considered to be a fantastic filter, uh, synthesizer. But you'll notice this is a monolith. There are no modules here. It is pre-wired to do things. And what I love about these synthesizers is every control has a purpose. So you know you know, you have uh, very much a tactile physical control that you can do over things. And that's very much unlike today, where we have essentially computers that are trying to behave like user interfaces on synthesizers, where the screen and the buttons and things like that are actually responsible for it. I particularly hate these kinds of synthesizers, and I'm much more happy to use something like this, which is my, one of my synthesizers in my collection from 1977, the Korg MS-20, which has probably the most beautiful filter in the world, and you've heard it on a million albums, everything from Daft Punk to David Bowie. Uh, but what you'll notice is interesting here is that this synth is divided in half, and on one side you have knobs and so, on the other side you have patch jacks where you plug in cables, and that's because this was the transition period of when modular synthesizers like the dinosaurs began to die off and uh, monolithic synthesizers took over. 
And if we go back even further, this is Don Buchla. In the 1950s, 1960s, uh, it was scientists and academics who were playing with this stuff. They needed frequency generators and things to manipulate sounds, and they were doing things like sonar and audio uh, experiments. And they would put things into racks because that's what you did. I mean, this is how telecommunication systems work. You've seen, you know, people with jacks switching phone lines in the 1940s and so. Uh, and the reason they did this was each module could be removed easily. So if something failed, as they often did, they could remove that module and put another one in. Don Buchla, by the way, was an amazing uh, electronics engineer, and he uh, was a pioneer in a lot of this stuff until in the 1960s when he got hooked up on the uh, acid bus and started touring America giving out tabs of acid, but that's another story. But what does this have to do with microservices? So if I were to describe a modular system, any kind of modular system, it's a series of purpose-built modules each using common standards for installation, formats, parameters, and event handling. So that's the essentials of either a modular synthesizer or a microservice system. Now, we have different kinds of modules in a synthesizer, and each one has a different purpose. So you have oscillators and filters and so forth. Uh, each one of those is designed to fulfill a role, and you can wire them up in different ways as needed. And in the same way, in the microservice world, we have different microservices that we design and code that have different purposes. They might be an API to get data. It might be to look up something. We might be generating a template or analyzing some information, some data. And in a modular world, um, there are essentially four kinds of signals. So every one of these jacks is sending the same type of voltages through them. And those voltages represent either audio that you can hear, or they represent control voltages, which happen when you turn a knob or want to change a parameter. They represent gates, which is like a door opening and closing, um, as if you had pressed and held a keyboard on the piano, a, a key on the piano. And they represent triggers, which are momentary events which tell you that something has happened, like a clock signal, which would periodically fire uh, at a regular interval. So along with that has to come standards. Eurorack, which is this standard now, has standards for infrastructure, the, the physical parts of things and how they screw together in the power cables. It has standards for the audio, the size of the jacks and the voltages. It has standards for the parameters, how the, the control voltages work and their ranges. It has standards for how the triggers and gates work. And in microservices, we also need to decide on standards. So at Ricardo, for example, our infrastructure in the software world is uh, Kubernetes. It's our standards about monitoring and so forth. That's our platform. The payload, which is like the audio, is the JSON and XML data that services send to each other. The parameters are literally parameters that you might have in an API um, you, on the URL or in headers or so forth. The events that we have are things that are triggered, for instance, with Kafka, or they might be uh, um, callbacks. And let's talk about triggers for a second. So I can demonstrate some triggers here. I have a, uh, a clock generating device on this side, and I'm actually going to just plug it into what's called a, um, let's see here, let me just get this wired up quickly. And I should have some kind of a sound. Out. Might be really quiet. There you go. You can hear that. So that's a that's a clock signal, and it's just a momentary uh, electrical pulse that's happening. I can change the tempo of it just by tapping in a tempo. Um, and what can I actually do with that? So if I wanted to have something else happen, I'm going to go to a different module over here which is a string synthesizer. And this makes um, string-like sounds. That sounds a bit more musical. 
And then I can control the pitch of that, and I'm going to do that with what's called a low frequency oscillator, which is just, just think of a sine wave. Oh, it's behaving very strangely. See, it stopped working. Why? Let me re-plug in here. Yeah, it's not working. Okay. Um, so the point is, is that the it can trigger basically anything to happen. Um, as another example, I could trigger a drum sound here. Let me do that. Let's see if you hear anything there that it should be triggering. Did you lose audio? Yeah. It's not working. Okay. Nothing. No. As I said, it's like live coding. Should be getting something. You're not getting anything? Okay. Let me just try a basic sound. Yeah, that works. Okay. Oh, I know why. Wrong jack. So you get the idea. So let me go back. So one of the things that's important when you are designing modules or microservices is you have to make deliberate choices about the components, quality, and testing, and so forth. Um, when I went back and did research for this, I looked at old manuals which uh, describe synthesizers from past days, and I was shocked at how they sounded a lot like the discussions I have at work with people about how we should build software. Each instrument is assembled from high quality components with pride and care, quality control, testing. Uh, things can be rearranged as you need them. Here's another one where they talk about conservative design, that it's real time, portability, cost is reasonable. All things are compatible, things are consistent. These are the things we strive for. But the problem with the, in the, at that time was that there were so many different standards. Every company had their own idea. And this is kind of where we are in the microservice world, too. These are a list of all the different types and, and the connectors they had. They weren't compatible. There were different kinds of cables that didn't work together. The tunings even were different. And they were large and expensive. That all changed when this man, David Dope, uh, um, Dopefer, Dieter Dopfer uh, was approached by Kraftwerk, and they said, we want to use these modular synthesizers in our, our stage productions, but we don't want to take these old machines that break all the time. So he invented a new standard and built some things for them, and he came up with this A100 system in the, in the mid-1990s, which used essentially like ribbon cables that you see in PCs and rack standards that we use in servers today, and he used all the existing standards uh, to make it more affordable and easier and more approachable. And nothing happened for a while until the 2000s when he decided he wanted to see more people making modules for this standard, so he kind of open sourced it. He posted all the specifications online and encouraged other people to do their own modules for it. And he's basically created a whole revolution. And where we are today is amazing. These are some modules that um, are made. I, I have a, one of these. The design is beautiful. They're made by this guy, uh, Olivier Pinochet, who is in um, Paris, and he's kind of a one-man operation. He makes uh, like a dozen different modules and has them mass-produced after he's tested them. These are modules made by IntelliGel, a Canadian company. And again, this is Dan, who is uh, kind of a software engineer guy and also a hardware guy. He designs these modules, gets them produced with his company. I love this. Uh, brand, which is Make Noise, and they go back to the experimental, you know, we often think synthesizers imitate real sounds, but they can create otherworldly crazy sounds, and this company uh, loves that. They're based in North Carolina, and they have a, kind of a scrum-like development environment where they do short iterations and a small team. Um, here's a beautiful one from a Spanish company, Endorphins. They put their artwork and their love into the design of things. And um, this is a uh, folk tech, which uses materials like copper and brass and things. All of these things have to be sourced from components. Uh, they have to build them and design them. And what does this have to do with microservices? Well, 
after you've worked with the synth for a while and made some cool music, it might look like this. And if you've worked with microservices for a while and wired things up, your architecture may look like this too. And that's a problem. If you're a solo musician, it's okay. You know what everything here does. But if you're working in a team, that's not acceptable. So another point of this is I started to think of things differently when I got into this. So for instance, at, at Ricardo, we needed to design a new auction engine for how to run an auction. Imagine when you're designing a microservice to envision a user interface. It should be user-centric. In this case, I, I've imagined uh, you could actually make a real module like this in a modular synth that could run an auction. You specify the start of when the auction should begin, how long it should run. Any time a bid has happened, it's a trigger. And if the bid is higher than the amount of the last person, it would send a signal. If not, it would ignore it. And you could even have triggers that happen when the uh, auction has expired or a bid has been ended or exceeded and so forth. And uh, you could pause the auction. So just with these controls, you could visually imagine if I were to design this microservice, uh, how would it look in the real world? This is an interesting thing to try. And most importantly, when you're designing uh, your microservices, try to not build a monolith, because it's quite easy to do that if you don't think differently about things. Think in terms of components, think in terms of the reusability of them, and that they do one thing really well, and they don't do everything. So there's not much point in building a complex modular synth unless you make music. And by the same token, there's no point in making a microservice uh, architecture and platform unless you have a great product behind it. So if you're interested in this stuff, if I piqued your curiosity, I would recommend you check out VCV Rack, which is an open source software project which allows you to actually uh, simulate this environment and do it on your computer. Some of the modules I've shown you today are available uh, for you to play with through a visual interface, and it's free, and they take pull requests. There's also a wonderful documentary called I Dream of Wires, which uh, is available on Netflix or online. And um, you can watch this. It talks a lot about the history of modular synths. Finally, if you're interested in my music, uh, you can go to SoundCloud. I have over 40 followers. So I'm quite famous on SoundCloud. Thank you very much. I'm very proud. <laughs> And uh, I'm also on Twitter as Foz. You can tell I started Twitter right when they began because I have a short username. Um, and I need to give a pitch, which is uh, we're here with InterVenture. If you don't know InterVenture, they're an amazing company. They believe in conjoined teams and working in an in a agile way. As such, all of the companies they work with work the way we do. They're the kind of companies you'd want to work with. Really cool group of guys who do great stuff. Come by the Ricardo Interventure booth. You could win some of these amazing prizes. That Toblerone is huge. I'm not joking. It's like this big. And uh, you might also win a Swiss Army knife, which is very useful in case you get stuck with patch cables wrapped around your body. Uh, and then finally, what else can this thing do? So I'm just going to improvise and play some garbage for you now. Thank you. OK, so let's start by using this. Let's get some tunes going here. So now I'm trying to get some drum sounds going. Yeah, 
that's better. Okay, and now I'm gonna get another drum. <laughs> yeah.